So two short readings um, this morning. First of all, from St. John's Gospel, chapter 12. Jesus speaking about his death. John 12, 23. Jesus answered them, The hour has now come for the Son of Man to receive great glory. I am telling you the truth. A grain of wheat remains no more than a single grain, unless it is dropped into the ground and dies. If it does die, then it produces many grains. Whoever loves his own life will lose it. Whoever hates his own life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever wants to serve me must follow me, so that my servant will be with me where I am, and my Father will honour anyone who serves me. And then actually continuing a few verses from the Acts of the Apostles that we've been studying, um, Acts 11.19. Some of the believers who were scattered by the persecution which took place when Stephen was killed went as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus and Antioch telling the message to Jews only. But other believers, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and proclaimed the message to Gentiles also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's power was with them and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. The news about this reached the church in Jerusalem, so they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived, he saw how God had blessed the people. He was glad and urged them all to be faithful and true to the Lord with all their hearts. Barnabas was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and many people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. When he found him, he took him to Antioch, and for a whole year the two met with the people of the church and taught a large group. It was at Antioch that the believers were first called Christians. About that time, some prophets went from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them, named Agabus, stood up and by the power of the Spirit predicted that a severe famine was about to come over all the earth. It was when Claudius was emperor. The disciples decided that each of them would send as much as he could to help their fellow believers who lived in Judea. They did this then and sent the money to the church elders by Barnabas and Saul. About this time, King Herod began to persecute some members of the church. He had James, the brother of John, put to death by the sword. And when he saw that this pleased the Jews, he went on to arrest Peter. On this Sunday, which um, was traditionally called Passion Sunday, we think of the victory of the cross. When we come to Good Friday, it is good that we think of the details of the crucifixion, of the historic event, of what Jesus said and what the people said and what they did and we need to retain our understanding and knowledge of the detail, the blood and the sweat and the tears of the crucifixion. And yet, as we know, that is not any, any old crucifixion. <laughs> Many people were crucified. The cross of Christ is, a, is, is a drawing a line in the sand of time. It is a cosmic event. The cross of Christ and the triumph of the cross means that the power of sin is broken. The devil does not just have a bad day. He does not recover. It means that sins can be forgiven. It means that we can have new life and eternal life. That Jesus is alive and at large in his spirit with us this morning. And very much that this is as much Easter day as any other day. We don't have to wait hanging on hoping that something will turn up in a fortnight's time. That is the good news of Jesus. This is the good news of the triumph of the cross. 
It is interesting that within the New Testament, when the disciples and the apostles and other preachers recount what Jesus did, they do not recount most of the things that Jesus did. They do not recount how he led them and how he taught them and how he fed them. They say one thing again and again and again. They say how he died for them on the cross. This is at the centre of the good news. Without the cross, as St Paul would have said, we are just wasting our time. We would be better off enjoying the sunshine out there. But as we look at these passages and we have this short parable of the seed falling into the earth, these passages, particularly in John's Gospel, when he thinks, talks about his coming death, it is most definitely a death. There are places where it is compared to being lifted up like the serpent was lifted up in the Old Testament and people in faith could look to it to be saved in those days from their, from their illness. Jesus is not hung up on the cross as a symbol we believe, and he's taken down again and has rehab. Jesus dies. It is a death, an absolute death. And it is a sacrificial death. Jesus does not die from old age. He doesn't die from being run over by a chariot. And he doesn't die from being drowned in a storm in the sea. He, no one takes my life away. I give it up. At the centre of the cross is sacrificial and this is not a conducive sort of thing to talk about. We, we, sacrifice and death is not something that you feel cheerful about. And yet it is necessary. Without it, none of this would have worked. We would have no new life at all. And the, the disciples that come after Jesus are called to take up their cross and for Anybody comes after me. Or as it's put together, more familiar in Mark 8... If anyone wants to follow me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. And those early disciples are caused to follow Jesus in sacrifice, even unto death. And so we find that the martyrs, people like um, Stephen, we read about here, and uh, James are executed unto martyrdom for their Christianity. And all the martyrs that followed them, the many hundreds and thousands in the early years of the church. But even since, we know of the Victorian Christians going into wild places, warned not to do it, sacrificially going there and being, being massacred by what were then savage tribes. We, you hear of somebody like Dietrich Bonhoeffer that most definitely sacrifices himself in the face of... Uh, of the Nazi, re Nazi regime. We think of today in, 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 in um, the Middle East and in sub-Saharan Africa, very often young people being told that they can renounce Jesus or, being, or be executed. And many of them being executed. At the moment, we are unlikely to face martyrdom in taking up our cross to follow Jesus. Whether that is a matter of time, I don't know. Political correctness may one day change all of that. But I do wonder sometimes, and it's worth reflecting, if the thought police turned up outside and took us out and lined us up and said, right, you renounce Jesus or you're shot, I wonder how I would do. I've thought about that quite often over the years, and I've had to say, I don't know. I don't know. Being me, I'd find 57 reasons why I'd be more useful to Jesus alive than dead. <laughs> and deep down in the 57, there would be cowardice with a long theological word to hide it. It's good to feel you're not sure. But this is, this is end game, if you like, and it's worse. How much do I believe this? How much is it real? What would I do? Because it's salutary. But it's not likely. And most of the Christians in the early church are not martyred. Most of the disciples do not die. Or they die of old age or some other thing. Most of these people in the New Testament are not martyred unto death. Which does not mean they do not take up their cross. And it does not mean just because they are not martyred, taking up your cross does not mean less than death. It means death in other ways and in other times. 
Gentiles. And we see writ large in these passages of the Acts of the Apostles that dying is important and crucial to discipleship. Did we not say that with um, the likes of, I mean, even the disciples being called, you know, when, 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 for instance, Matthew is called to cease being a tax gatherer and become a disciple, there is a sense in which he dies to a complete lifestyle, probably a, a complete economy in his life as well, a whole thing that he's been brought up and made a career of it, and he dies to that. He, he forsakes it. The disciples are called to die to the fishermen, to, to die to fishing. Our dear old Peter found this difficult. He spent much of the gospel, as you might say, with one foot in the boat and one foot on the bank. And it wasn't until after the, the interview, after the resurrection, that we actually die to fishing altogether. And these are important careers and security and ethos and life and family. There is a dying in discipleship. We find this in, in, in these passages we've read recently, haven't we? Where Paul has to, has to definitely give up being a Pharisee in the way he was. Or do rush back to Jerusalem and do a bit of Pharisee. I don't know what the word is. Being a Pharisee anyway. You know, three days a week. He gives it up. It goes. End of story. And with Peter, the business with the, with the sheet and the animals, all of his whole history of what is holy and righteous and what God wants. And God says, I'm not interested in that. It's a huge sort of mental, psychological funeral at this point. It goes. We underestimate it because we're not interested in that sort of thing. And when the early church is confronted with the, 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 all these uncircumcised Gentiles being filled with the Spirit, a huge dying when they say, oh, well, let it go. Yeah, let it go. The early church has to learn to die to this and that and then and there. And just because it's not martyrdom does not mean it's not death. And then sometimes it might be more painful because you've got to live with it. I think for us then, if we are called to take up our own cross, it's going to involve probably not martyrdom, but it's going to, it's going to involve dying to self and dying to this and this and this. I'm just thinking of some examples, and I'm, I'm not good at examples of this because I'm not very good at doing it. Um, but you can think of perhaps more examples than I. But I'm thinking of, say you've got a, you go down, you see, you're going to visit somebody and you sort of see a friend or somebody and you say, I'll just come and see you after tea, early, early evening, you know, early evening. Now, when you go and see somebody early evening, you mean you're going to get home for a bit of time after it, don't you? <laughs> make, a, make an early start means you can get away. But it's when you, when somebody has got a lot to pour out to you and a lot, to share with you and you can hear it's going on and on and you think I don't know how long this is going to take <laughs> but at some stage you say I'm going to stop thinking when am I going to get home I'm going to stop thinking how am I going to squeeze in all the things I want to do this evening in this rapidly reducing time you just say I'm just going to write it off this evening I'm going to write it off. Let it go. There isn't going to be any evening. That is a dying. It's when you say, I think I need to be more generous. And if I'm more generous, it probably means I need less money to spend on this or this, which I was going to spend it on. To die is to say, actually, I'm not going to ever buy that. I'm not going to buy it. It's not going to fall down my list of priorities. It's going to fall off my list of priorities. And there is a dying there, isn't there? Or there is something which makes you who you are, a historic identity, something you picked up from your parents that's always been important to you, always been something that's made you you. And you think, I just need to make this less of a priority, less important. And then you think, I actually don't need it at all. And there's a death there. Take up your cross and follow me. At this point and this point and this point and the grain of wheat needs to fall into the earth and die. 
But then, says Jesus, if it does fall into the earth and die, it sprouts up and produces many grains and a great harvest. We are here this morning not because Jesus had a sacrificial death like some historic heroic person who makes us feel good and makes us feel guilty and makes us feel that we should follow him. Jesus is not some tragic person who does some amazing event and we're all here to remember it and to emulate it. The sacrifice of the death of Christ is is the beginning of the resurrection. The grain of wheat falls into the earth and produces a great crop. It doesn't fall into the earth and we build a cemetery around it. It falls into the earth and produces a harvest and we are that harvest. If you are somebody who's given your life to Christ and let the power of his resurrection live in you, you are part of his harvest. And if you haven't done that, do that because he has died for you. He has given his life on the cross for you. That you can have new life and resurrection. And it's interesting to see that those early martyrs. Well now, you think about them. Think about Stephen, for instance. They followed Jesus all the way to the cross. We know, and the Bible tells us, that when they are martyred, they are resurrected to life and they live with Christ in heaven. No question of it. But we can also see in the Acts of the Apostles that they become a catalyst for church growth. When this, um, these passages where the church is developing and growing, Luke takes us back and says, strings it all the way back to the martyrdom of Stephen. In that passage, he goes all the way back. You wonder why that, after all that business with Peter and Cornelius and all that, he takes it right back to the martyrdom of Stephen and said it was at the martyrdom of Stephen that the church was spread all over the place and this whole thing kicked off. It's in the midst of all these barriers and boundaries being crossed and the church burgeoning out that we throw in the fact that one of the senior leaders is simply executed by Herod. These martyrdoms are a catalyst for church growth. Not just because everybody was very impressed and they set a great example. But because these are channels of grace. Where these people pick up their own cross and are willing to die to themselves. Then the power of the resurrection of Jesus breaks through. Those of you who are doing the theology of this will know that we are not saying that because they died, they are a help to people. We're not spiritualists. Our forefathers who were saints are not hanging around giving us a time, giving us a help. They are, they are in heaven. But it is the power of God, the power of Jesus that breaks through where men such as this are prepared to die to the old and to be raised to the new life in Christ. And that applies to all the other people in the New Testament as well who died to, if you might, lesser things. And so is it not when Peter is prepared to die to all that business about, um, uh, you know, his, his, the business with the holiness and kosher food and Gentiles and all that stuff. When he does that, it's at that point when he goes into Cornelius' house and starts his sermon. It's at that point when he's only just started that the spirit falls and there's a huge new thing. In other words, there is a point of resurrection at the point of death. When he is sacrificially prepared to say, the old Peter is gone, Jesus can say, yes, and I've got something to do here. There's a resurrection out of sacrificial death. And the early church, when they finally say, okay, let's, you know, bin circumcision. And all the idea of Old Testament covenant and the huge thing about how to be the people of God is bend. Then there is resurrection at that point of death. Then the power of God breaks in. And then we see all this burgeoning out. Not only now do we have boundaries broken, not only now do we have all sorts of people talking to all sorts of 
um, Samaritans and Romans and hangers-on and Gentiles, but we also have the beginnings of fellowship and community. There's going to be a famine, so let us Gentiles have a collection for the Jewish church, and the money starts to flow around. There's the beginning of community and help and mission and all this out of death. You know, for you and I, we depend upon the sacrificial death of Jesus, but we allow his power to work in us and his resurrection power to break through at the point at which we are prepared to take up our cross and die. And year after year, we have the power of the resurrection, which is not really breaking through into our lives because we resist points of dying. You cannot have the Lord's resurrection unless you are prepared for some death somewhere. I don't like death. I prefer improvement and resuscitation and all that sort of thing. I love growth miracles, but I don't like death miracles. At the point of death comes life. Is it not, after all, the time you've given up your time and hung in there with somebody that they pray the prayer that changes their life? And okay, you missed the 10 o'clock news, but their life was changed. And not only is it um, that the kingdom grows, but as St. Paul says, I find the resurrection in myself. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. As Elliot says, isn't it, Um, that uh, when we die, when there is a death, there is a new beginning and a new life. At the end of the um, poem on the, uh, uh, the journey of the Magi, he said, I would be glad of another death. I would be glad of another death. Because here is, here is new life. We had an old chorus when we were boys and used to sing, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. And there was a line in that, there is no joy, no peace, no thrill like walking in his will. At that point of resurrection. We come to see this morning to, to communion. We give thanks for the sacrificial death of Jesus. That is the big thing. Thank you, Lord, that you died for me and thus risen for me. And I can have resurrection life. But I am called to take up my own cross. And where I am prepared to die, then you can break in with new life and resurrection into my life, into our lives, into the life of the church. And my gosh, the church doesn't like dying, does it? But there should be fresh life this morning in your life.